Welcome to Distancing with the Stars. My name is Eric McLaughlin and I am the astronomer for the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. In this show, we will take whirlwind tours of various places in the universe and today we will zip around Saturn with a focus on some of its moons. We will not be able to go into depth on many things, but our aim with this journey is to pique your interest and get you exploring yourself. So here we are above the Earth on September 15th, 2020, and we have a lot of places to go and see. So let's go. At this point in time, Jupiter and Saturn appear quite close in our sky. However, they are actually very far apart. Jupiter is around five times further from the sun than the Earth is, while Saturn is around nine to 10 times further from the sun than the Earth is. Saturn is the second largest and second most massive planet in the solar system. It is referred to as a gas giant because it is a large planet made mostly of hydrogen and helium. Although deep within the planet near the rocky core, the hydrogen is believed to actually be in a liquid metallic state. While Saturn's crystal ammonia tinted cloud tops can appear featureless, there is actually a lot of activity in its atmosphere. One notable feature of the planet's cloud top surface is its north polar vortex, which makes a distinct hexagonal shape. Speaking of the north, we have arrived during Saturn's northern summer. You can tell by the way the northern half of the planet is tilted towards the sun. However, since Saturn takes about 29 and a half Earth years to orbit around the sun, a given season there lasts for over seven Earth years. Of course, one of the most fascinating and picturesque aspects of Saturn are its rings. Made mostly of bits of ice ranging from microscopic in size to that of large boulders, the rings are quite reflective and very dynamic. Spikes, spokes, propellers, and jets are just some of the interesting features that can be seen in the rings. And except for those spikes, the rings are confined to a thickness of, of around 10 to 20 meters. This makes it practically disappear against the giant planet when viewed edge on. The rings form such a beautiful array of details, but what causes some of the more persistent facets? For example, what causes those distinct gaps? Well, one answer is shepherd moons. Mostly small moons which orbit within the rings and scoop up or clear out ring material in a region around them. Pan is a wonderful little example of a shepherd moon and is currently the inmost named moon of Saturn. At around 35 kilometers across, it would easily stretch across the Coachella Valley. However, the Enki Gap in which it resides is only around 325 kilometers across, comparable to the width of California in some places. A buildup of ring material is likely responsible for that ridge you see, uh, which has caused Pan to be compared to several different food items like a walnut, a raviolo, empanada, or wonton. Okay, now I'm hungry. Anyway, off to Enceladus. This snowball of a moon is around 500 kilometers in diameter, which means its circumference is similar to driving from the Coachella Valley to around Eugene, Oregon. Because of its bright, icy surface, this moon is often compared to Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. However, they are quite different in size. Nevertheless, their similarities are more than superficial. Indeed, both worlds hide liquid water beneath their surfaces. At Enceladus, this water is most evident at the moon's south pole at a set of features known as the Tiger Stripes. As we are here in Saturn's southern winter, very little light falls on this region right now. These stripes are the source of dramatic geysers, which are powerful enough to eject water completely off the moon to the extent that it contributes to Saturn's E-ring. 
Now, from one moon with a very interesting south pole to one with a very interesting north pole. Thus, while we're headed to Titan, we will need to reorient ourselves. Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system and the largest and most massive of Saturn's moons. In fact, Titan accounts for around 96% of all the mass in orbit around Saturn. Most notably, Titan is the only moon in the solar system with a substantial atmosphere. In fact, the surface pressure on Titan is just under 1.5 times what we are living in right now. Titan's atmospheric pressure is what you would feel swimming around 4.6 meters underwater. You would need to pop your ears, but otherwise you would be quite comfortable. Well, actually, the temperature might impact your comfort a bit. With average temperatures around minus 180 degrees Celsius, the weather is outright cryogenic. Indeed, there is active weather on Titan, resulting in thick haze, rain, rivers, lakes, and even seas. However, these bodies of liquid are not made of water, but rather liquid hydrocarbons, such as liquid methane and ethane. We drop below the haze over Legia Mare, a hydrocarbon sea made famous by the detection of a magic island in radar data. The apparent island may have been a dramatic off-gassing of nitrogen, surface waves, or loose subsurface ice, but we may not fully know the exact answer for decades. This sea is known as Kraken Mare and is the largest known sea on Titan. At around a half a million square kilometers, it is larger than the Caspian Sea on Earth. Several ambitious missions have been proposed to explore the seas and lakes of Titan, but as of now, we can expect these seas to remain unsailed for some time to come. And perhaps that is for the best, because there is still some uncertainty as to whether there could be a film or other buildup of material on the surface of the seas. Now, Kraken Mare is divided into two large sections by a strait known as Seldon Fretum, but it is nicknamed the Throat of Kraken. Because of Titan's orbit around Saturn, some tidal activity is expected in Kraken, which would yield a significant flow rate through this strait. In fact, a recent article published in the Planetary Science Journal analyzing sun glitter off the liquid surface indicates waves which may be caused by this flow. Though you may not want to get your surfboard out just yet, these waves may be best measured in centimeters. However, more work is needed to fully understand the wave height in Selden Fretum. I've turned off the haze layer to give us some perspective on where Saturn is, but with a clear sky, we can get a new perspective on the surface of Titan. The vast majority of the lakes and seas on Titan have been found at its North Pole. However, there are plenty of interesting features on the surface of Titan. Near the equator of the moon are a number of dark regions, which include some vast dune fields. Near one such region named Shangri-La is where the ESA's Huygens probe landed. It landed in an apparent riverbed at the edge of the Adiri region and returned one of the most distant images ever taken from the surface of a planet or moon. While I've mentioned dunes and riverbeds, these regions may not be as dry as they seem. There may be a significant amount of liquid methane and other hydrocarbons within the soil of these regions, similar to the water table we have here on Earth. To investigate more of this surface of Titan, NASA's Dragonfly mission is aiming to first land in the Shangri-La dune field in 2034. I say first land because the craft resembles a quadcopter, except that it has two sets of propellers at each corner and will fly to many locations once its mission begins. As we pass over where the sun is setting on Titan, we will pause over the Adiri and Shangri-La regions. The Huygens probe, long since shut down, has entered another eight day long night. With that, we will head to Saturn's third largest moon. Iapetus was discovered by Giovanni Cassini on the west side of Saturn. His inability to spot the moon on the other side of Saturn led him to the correct conclusion that Iapetus had bright and dark hemispheres. They are split in much the same way a tennis ball is divided. 
The bright side shows exposed water ice while the dark side appears to be covered in lag or residue left behind by the evaporation of water ice. Like all of the previous moons we have looked at, Iapetus is tidally locked, which means the dark side of the moon always faces the direction the moon is traveling. We still do not fully understand how Iapetus came to look this way, but if the material is lag, then a small difference in color may have initiated a thermal runaway which enhanced the difference between the two sides. A darker surface absorbs more sunlight, causing more evaporation, causing the surface to darken more, and so on. On the dark side, a prominent ridge is visible at the moon's equator. Stretching 1,300 kilometers long and 13 kilometers high, this ridge gives Iapetus a bit of a walnut look. While there are a number of ideas as to how the ridge formed, they all have trouble explaining why the ridge does not extend to the bright side of the moon, aside from a few isolated peaks. We have time for one more stop, and for me personally, a tour of Saturn is not complete without a stop at the smallest known astronomical body that is still round due to self-gravitation, Mimas. This little ball of mostly ice is around 400 kilometers across, and its most well-known surface feature is Herschel Crater, which has caused Mimas to be referred to as the Death Star Moon. The crater is nearly one-third the diameter of Mimas, and it is thought that if the object that hit it was only a bit larger or more energetic, then Mimas could have been destroyed. There is a spot on the northeastern edge of the crater that I want to take you to. It is one of my favorite places in the solar system. While we are on our way there, note the big gap in the rings. It's not completely clear of ring material, but its relative sparseness is at least part because of Mimas. You see, Mimas takes just under one Earth day to orbit around Saturn, and the material in that section of the rings takes around half that time. Thus, for material in the Cassini division, each time Mimas completes one orbit, its gravity will tug on that material in the same way. Over time, this causes material to leave the Cassini division. Here we are. For perspective, the field of view of this camera is around 45 degrees. Thus, from this point, Saturn absolutely dominates the horizon, and the rings stretch nearly halfway between that horizon and zenith, that is directly overhead. Moreover, as Mimas is also tidally locked, Saturn does not depart from that horizon, so let's see what a day at this location looks like. As the day progresses, note how the moon's interior to Mimas' orbit rise between us and Saturn, while everything else rises beyond Saturn. Mimas' orbit is also slightly inclined to the rings, so the rings seem to wobble from our perspective. Every day, a unique variant of this spectacle plays out from this spot. Oh, that I could set foot here and watch the splendor evolve moment to moment before my eyes. Alas, for us, it is but to dream and envision. We may one day reach here to more than image and imagine, to rather comprehend. Today we have glimpsed one small page of a vast and infinite text. Should humanity know this place as home, there will be still more pages than could ever be read. But that daunting notion should not keep our eyes from their symbols and our minds from their meaning. With that, thank you for joining us, and thank you to the Library and Observatory Foundation for making this possible.